If you're driving along blissfully, insufferably one day in your planet-saving virtue mobile, and then the world turns on a sixpence and you tragically strike and nearly kill a pedestrian, relying on autopilot made me do it, it's probably not the most viable defence imaginable. Oddly enough, a case highlighting this and related issues is playing out in an Australian court as we speak. I'm Dean Logan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars. Hogan! <laughs> Cheap. Australia only. Website. Card. Now, in March of last year, and if you don't mind, I'm going to refer to my notes a little more than usual because this is kind of a serious issue and I don't want to get anything wrong. It's alleged that a 24-year-old woman named Sakshi Agrawal, she's an Indian national, was driving a Tesla Model 3 in Melbourne when it struck and seriously injured a 27-year-old specialist clinical nurse named Nicole Lagos. This is a very stressful situation for all parties concerned and the ripples just... They extend through society. There's family members that are impacted and the police and the paramedics that get called. And one of the main reasons for me doing this is if you could just go back in time and change a few variables, none of this would have happened, right? So given that we can't do that, maybe you could just pay a bit more attention when you drive and thereby avoid you being the subject of a report such as this. This is my principal reason for doing it, right? According to witnesses who testified in Melbourne Magistrates Court recently, Ms Lagos was boarding a tram at the time she was struck. The Model 3 hit her, she flew into the air, and when she hit the deck, she had sustained some serious injuries, life-threatening injuries to her head and legs. And because she was not present in the court and watched instead by video, link with her father, as I understand it. I'm inferring that her medical problems are far from over. Anyway, this happened on basically 6.30am on the 22nd of March 2022, which is just over a year ago now. And like, dude, just when you thought the pandemic's practically over and life can't get any worse, like, Jesus, it's a hell of a way to start the day. Or I don't know, end the day in the case of a nurse. Nursing is, of course, a 24-7 profession, is it not? Anyway, police allege that Ms Agrawal, the driver, actually fled the scene of this collision, uh, but she returned later to turn herself in. So I guess that's some degree of mitigation. Probably not the best course of action, though. Pro tip, okay? If you are in a crash in Australia, any sort of crash... The law requires you to stop and sort things out. If someone is injured, there is an absolute legal, not to mention moral and ethical priority, obligation, some would say, upon you to stop and render assistance to the injured, okay? We don't police morality and ethics, obviously, but we certainly do enforce the law, and the law says you've got to stop and help the injured, among other post-crash obligations, right? You are absolutely not allowed just to drive away. It doesn't work this way. And I really don't know how strenuously this is. This information is given to foreign nationals who come here and drive around on our roads. And there are quite a few people in that camp. And if you want to accuse me of being a racist off the back of that comment, then I would suggest right off, dude, and get back in your box, because this is in no way a racist analysis. It's just that, do we inform foreign nationals driving on our roads sufficiently about their obligations to the laws? And I'd suggest that if we dive down into that, probably we could do a better job with that, these critical obligations that pertain when you drive a car. You know, certainly worth looking at, is it not? Ms Agrawal faces four counts in court, right? Dangerous driving causing serious injury, which is an offence under the Crimes Act. Failing to stop, failing to render assistance and negligently causing serious injury. And no one would want to be walking a mile in those shoes, I'd suggest, because 
very stressful, time-consuming, expensive mounting a, def a defence in court against, uh, you know, allegations of this nature, right? She earlier claimed, according to numerous reports in the media, that the Elon Musk shitbox she was driving at the time of the incident was on autopilot. So there's that. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to give you legal advice, but I would not be making any statements to the cops if they were investigating me for anything, but especially not in the immediate aftermath of a stressful incident such as this, right? Now, I know there are some legal obligations about making a statement if you're involved in a collision where somebody is injured, but it doesn't have to be a detailed statement. It's just like, yeah, dude, I was driving that car at about 6.30 in the morning when the crash occurred. And after that, common law right to silence. That's where I'd be going with that. Certainly until I'd had time to talk to my legal representation. The pro tip there, it doesn't really matter what the 21st century's biggest charlatan, who's not Donald Trump, claims about the systems for partly automated driving built into that car. Whatever the claims are, whatever it's called, it's not actually an autopilot. Not in the context of a Boeing 777 and the autopilot in that jigger, right? It's just not. The 777 actually has an autopilot, right? You could defend that claim, but a Tesla does not have an autopilot. That's indefensible. It's borderline misrepresentative marketing, in my view, to call the systems in that car autopilot. And it leads to a lot of dodgy behaviour out there on the road with those self-righteous twats praying at the Church of Electric Jesus. The pro pro tip on all of this, under Australian law, drivers, meaning the biological component of the vehicle hanging onto the frickin' steering wheel, are actually accountable and culpable for their actions and the consequences when they drive a car, even if the car is doing the driving, right? And I really don't know how clear they make that in the brochure advising foreign nationals of their obligations about driving in Australia. I don't know if that's even addressed, but, you know, just for complete clarity, you're responsible for the consequences of your actions when you drive a car, no matter what systems are engaged, right? Ms Agrawal, well, she pled not guilty, and after a day of witness testimony, the magistrate Natalie Haynes found that there was sufficient evidence to potentially secure a conviction, and the Melbourne Magistrates Court committed Ms Agrawal to stand trial. That trial has not occurred yet. This matter is still before the court. That's kind of important. They did also soften her bail conditions. She only has to front up at the cop shop twice a week now on a Sunday and she is not allowed to leave the state and she has to refrain from attending any ports or points of international departure because she's a foreign national and the prosecution argued that she was a flight risk. Okay, so that makes reasonable sense and it doesn't make all that much sense to stick her in the slammer until they can get around to the trial, I suppose. But she's living in the twilight zone of not knowing what the future holds for her, which would be its own version of living hell, I'd suggest. I don't think her barrister called any witnesses or made any particular submissions during the committal hearing. Apparently all she did was examine the prosecution's witnesses, which is a very unpleasant experience, having been an expert witness once or twice in court. All they try and do is shit can you and your qualifications and everything you say based mainly on technicalities. So that explains why I don't do that anymore. I just say no whenever a lawyer rings me and says, would you like to be an expert witness for us? I go, what's second prize, dude? Now, this matter is sub judice. It's before the court. So there has been no determination about Ms Agrawal's guilt or innocence. And that's really important. I'm not speculating about that now or what an appropriate penalty might be for her if she is ultimately convicted of any of these counts. That would be contempt of court. And I don't want to go 100% Lisa Wilkinson, not at this point in my career. Know what I'm saying? 
But there is a public interest dimension to all of this stuff because of the rapid deployment of new technology and the vast gulf between the claims in the brochure and what you're actually getting embodied in the vehicle. And it's considerable deficiencies. Let's just put it like that. Like, if you own a Tesla, I'd suggest, and you subscribe to Mr. Musk's repeated assaults on the epistemology of reality, which is exactly what the description of autopilot is, in my view, you've got to at least acknowledge that autopilot is far from perfect. Some would say fundamentally flawed. Certainly it's got the wrong name. And if it fucks up when you are sitting behind the steering wheel, you're the bunny who's going to be eating the shit sandwich, dude. Like today's special, Great Dane, we're running low on bread, and there's no mayo kind of thing, right? The shit sandwich is mainly going to be shit, is what I'm saying, okay? Personally, I'd suggest that until there's full fail-safe autonomy deployed out there on the road, like I'm talking, press a button, talk to the assistant, say... Take me to the nearest massage parlour, nail emporium, whatever. Until there's that, and you can rely on that and just, you know, do some emails or something, and nobody dies, then I'd suggest that autonomous driving systems, these claimed partly autonomous driving systems, are only a liability. Because what they do is they make driving even more tedious. Like, you know how it is on the freeway, right? You're just sitting there and you've got a lot of energy, you're doing 110 k's an hour or something, but there's not a lot to do. Because, you know, Sydney to Canberra, three hours, bored shitless. So what it does is it really undermines your ability to concentrate on the core driving task, which is vigilance. People don't like sitting and concentrating on nothing for three hours at a stretch, so they goof off mentally, and that means that they open the door to disaster. So I don't see these systems as being in any way miraculous, and in fact, they are counterproductive if the end product of you getting from A to B is you keeping you and your family, whoever's in the car with you, and everyone else out there around you actually safe. And you've got to ask yourself, right, there's all these researchers, all these propeller heads doing all this research in all these super secret R&D facilities where if you're a journalist and you go inside, they confiscate your phone so you can't spill the beans on anything. They're all working on autonomy. How far away is it actually? And I'd say, according to the world's leading expert on this, dude, six to 24 months away. According to Elon Musk, he is the most prolific pontificator about the deployment of full autonomy, right? And it's always been six to 24 months. It's been six to 24 months for the past 10 years, according to EJ. And it's six to 24 months now. And I guarantee in 2040, full autonomy is going to be six to 24 months away. We'll have fusion power in roughly the same time frame, i.e. never. It's just like his miraculous battery technology. Like, he should pay off a porn star and run for president, I'd suggest, given the precedent that's already been set. So, flowing from that, just how shit is autopilot? Let's just look in the public domain about evidence of autopilot's fundamental shitness, shall we? We'll bear shitness to autopilot. From July 2021 to October 2022, which is 15 months, in America, there were 605 crashes involving cars using some bullshit automated driver assistance system at the time, okay? And 474 of those 605 crashes were Teslas. Go figure. What's that? About three quarters. That's according to the US Department of Transportation. And six years ago, the US National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, they presented the findings of their investigation into the Model S crash into a truck on an interstate which killed a 40-year-old dude named Joshua Brown, who was the quote-unquote driver of the Model S. 
That investigation found that in the 42 minutes prior to that fatal crash, the Model S had been in auto steering mode for 37 minutes, travelling at about $1.20 in k's an hour, which is 75 miles an hour. America. The car had given the driver visual warnings to place his hands on the steering wheel seven times, along with audible warnings as well, but it continued to drive when the soon-to-be-late Mr Brown, very late in the circumstances, failed to comply with those warnings. It just continued to autopilot the shit out of itself to Mr Brown's oblivion. The NTSB found that the Tesla autopilot had to bear at least some of the blame for the fatal crash because it had allowed the driver to become over-reliant on it and not pay proper attention to the road, unquote. More recently, on the 28th of February, there was a mainstream media newsgasm because Electric Jesus was facing yet another lawsuit. <laughs> it's got to be a baker's dozen or something by now, hasn't it? Anyway, the shareholders uh, of Tesla accused his e jesus <laughs> and the cult he founded. Like, he didn't found Tesla. That's bullshit. But he did certainly turn Tesla into a cult. And in that sense, I guess, he is the founder. So there's that. Anyway... They accuse him, the shareholders accuse him of overstating the effectiveness and the safety of autopilot. They also make the same allegation to the company itself. So it's not just on EJ, it's also on Tesla, the corporation. The shareholders alleged in the proposed class action lawsuit that Tesla defrauded them <laughs> over four years with false and misleading statements that concealed how autopilot, quote, created a serious risk of accident and injury. The case was filed late in February this year, so just a few weeks ago, in a San Francisco federal court. And I'd suggest that shareholders suing Elon Musk for misrepresenting autopilot, like, Jesus, what next? That's tantamount to heresy. It's like a hundred dead cardinals suing religious Jesus for overstating the features and benefits of heaven, is it not, you know? One of the dead cardinals might tell reporters, you know, quote, up here, it's all just endless clouds, harp music and insufferable twats. You wouldn't want that for ten minutes, let alone eternity. I actually think Christopher Hitchens first said that. R.I.P. dude. Although, according to Hitch, he's just gone, right? He doesn't exist anymore, so I don't know if it's possible for the, a non-existent entity to rest in peace, and I, I hope that he would not posthumously find that offensive. Anyway, whatever. Dead Cardinal Six might add, you know, one day I grew so bored that I walked all the way to the edge of heaven, expecting to be entertained by looking down on the suffering of the damned in hell. But when I got there... It was just more clouds and more harp music. If anything, the harp music had grown even louder. Someone is going to have to pay for this. Here, here. Dude, it's all the same on the mortal coil, I'd suggest, too, with autopilot. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens in respect of all of that. Damn you, printer. Printing out a blank page. So what can we glean from all of this that might be in some way helpful or productive? I'd suggest... But the one productive thing to bear in mind off the back of Ms Agrawal's terrible situation and the, the tragic case of the nurse and the ongoing burden of her injuries and all of that stuff is that whenever you report on an incident of this nature, which I've done several times over the years, it's quite confronting. And you realise that if there were a time machine and you could just go back and change two or three variables, then all of this unpleasantness could be averted and the future would be rosy for all concerned, right? And because we don't have the ability to do that, all you and I can do is learn from the plight of others. We could walk over to the edge of the clouds and look down at the suffering of the damned and decide how to comport ourselves behind the wheel. And I'd suggest that if you are going to get behind the wheel of a car today, tomorrow, anytime in the future, you've got to be the driver. 
you've got to be in charge. You have to acknowledge the serious fundamental responsibility that you bear every time you are in this position. You will be accountable for any damage that happens by virtue of your negligence to your passengers or to anybody else out there in society who is injured as a consequence of your actions. And you don't want to wake up in bed with a brain injury or unable to feel your legs and not even remember how you got there, right? This happens to too many people. And in almost all of those cases, you could just go back in time, just change one or two variables and not look at your phone or not goof off and not be looking at the playlist when you're supposed to be looking at the entry or the exit of that corner. And, you know, it's so simple to prevent this stuff, but it really does require individuals to take responsibility, dig deep and acknowledge that the core responsibility of driving is actually driving and the mitigation of risk.